Okay, we're going into the home stretch, um, but we have another good presentation that I think you'll enjoy. Okay, so as a special treat, we're going to have a second historical perspective. And uh, this is about the uh, German Enigma machine. I'm not gonna say much about it because uh, Professor Tom, yeah, I'll have to shoot you, exactly. Um, I, I also wanna point out that only at the radio club do you get to hear three professors in one day time. It's almost like going back to college, you know? <laughs> Scary thought. <laughs> no, I had all good professors. Um, so uh, Dr. Tom Pereira is a retired professor of neuroscience who specialized in the research on the coding of information on the human brain and nervous system. Somehow that led him to the Enigma machine. I'll let him tell us how that led to that. Um, he has become a world expert on Enigma machines. He has been collecting them from all over the world he has a museum, he has a website, he has books, and if you haven't been back there, he's got a working machine, and because I've read about this machine many times, it's absolutely astounding to touch it and look at the technology of the 1940s. So without further ado, Dr. Tom. Thank you all. A little bit of uh, comic relief coming up then. Uh, what I'm going to do is ask you to tune your brains down from terahertz to gigahertz to uh, megahertz to kilohertz to DC, a dramatically underused ham band, by the way, <laughs> and uh, very, very popular back in the 1920s and so, and, and uh, before that. So we're going to uh, start out uh, talking a little bit about the history of the Enigma and uh, the technology of the Enigma, and then a little bit about uh, finding Enigma. So we start out with the statement that uh, during World War II and before World War II, Hitler was trying to hide his buildup of the military, and he did that by using a machine he called the Enigma. Uh, the Enigma was used by all of the German forces, um, both uh, land, sea, and air, but specifically it was used very widely by the U-boats. And the U-boats were extremely effective during World War II. Indeed, U-boats sank a total of 3,000 ships and killed 150,000 men. So they were a very, very serious problem. And they were coordinated by radio, and the radio messages were coded using an Enigma machine. That's how I uh, managed to get into this uh, session. There's radio in there somewhere. Um, the uh, Enigma operators on submarines were highly trained and they used the Enigma for all of their radio communications back to the base. Um, so let's just take a look at the history of the Enigma and the, um, the inventor of the Enigma, which is uh, Arthur Scherbius. He named it Enigma, which means in German a puzzle. And uh, his first Enigma was this one on the left. And uh, like so many designs, initial designs, it failed to sell miserably. Weighed about 300 pounds, cost an incredible amount of money. And he was trying to sell it as a corporate security device. And nobody bought it. So somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, why don't you build a smaller model of this? And that is how the enigma that we know now uh, came to exist, at about the size of a typewriter. Come back and type on it in the back of the room, you'll see. And that design remained essentially unchanged from 1922 all the way up through 1945. Let's just uh, take a quick look inside it. Nicely modular design, but very, very simple DC circuitry. A battery box over here, a keyboard with uh, um, double, pole, double throw single pole switches, uh, a light bulb panel, and a plug board panel on the front. Nothing very complex, nothing very high frequency. Um, we have to take a look at how the Enigma encodes messages, and for that we have to go back 
to the time of Julius Caesar and the so-called Caesar Code, which was used even before Caesar. Very simple code in which you take the alphabet, A, B, C, and so on, and you set up a second alphabet, which is slid over from the first alphabet by a certain number of letters. And typically, you talk about that second alphabet being related to the first alphabet as the key, the key to the particular cipher you're talking about. So in this case, the key of the plain text letter A is equal to X. And uh, uh, a simple example of that is the uh, Civil War code wheel. This is a code wheel that was used by the Confederate States of America. And uh, the center part of this code wheel is capable of being rotated to a particular day's key. And in this case, we've set it to the key of A equals X. So the plain text letter A becomes the coded letter X. So if we want to code my name using a code wheel like this, we look up T, the first letter of my name, and it becomes a Q. The second letter of my name, O, becomes L. And the third letter of my name, M, becomes J. QLJ is the Civil War encoded version of my name, Tom. Now, if another general in the Civil War has his code wheel set the same way as this one, a messenger carries over the letters Q, L, J, delivers them to the general, he looks up Q and recovers the letter T, L and recovers the letter O, and J and looks, recovers the letter L. M, and he recovers my name, Tom. Very, very simple concept. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember that if you bought Cheerio cereal, you sometimes got these things inside the box. You'll recognize the system. But the amazing thing is that Sherbius looked at this system, and he invented an Enigma machine by doing a very, very simple modification of this. All he did was to arrange to have the center wheel of the code wheel rotate every time you type in a letter. Instead of leaving it at the day's key, the center part of the uh, wheel rotates uh, every time you, count, you type in a letter. So let's look at an Enigma machine and see how it works. We type in the letter A on the keyboard and a light bulb lights up on the panel back here. It's basically just a flashlight. There's a battery in there, a switch, activated by the key, and a light bulb lights up. In this case, the letter A has been typed in, and the letter X lights up. But the beauty of the enigma and his brilliant invention was that the next time you type in the letter A or any other letter, the rotors back here have rotated by one notch. And that one notch changes the internal wiring. And so when you press the letter A again, you get a different letter. And that's the way the Enigma works. It's really very simple concept, and it worked very, very well. Um, let's look at two Enigmas and see how they communicate. Let's say this one's on a submarine, and this one's at the home base. You type the letter A into the submarine Enigma, and the light bulb H lights up. As long as the decoding enigma is set to the same initial day's key, then typing in the letter H into that enigma will recover the original letter A. It's a reciprocal operation, very, very nicely designed by Sherbius. And for those of you who want to go with me to DC, that mysterious ham band, let's look at this DC circuit. Um, what we see is over here a battery, positive voltage of a battery. When you, when you type the letter A key, this switch comes over and the normally open contact closes and the positive voltage now comes into a plugboard panel on the front and then through these rotors back through a plugboard panel and it goes through the normally closed contacts of the H key and lights up the H bulb. Now let's go the other way. Let's say you want to encode or decode that H back to A. You press the H key, 
that puts a positive voltage back through this circuit and up through and lights up the letter A. Um, so it's a reciprocal circuit, and the critical thing, of course, is that the rotors over here be set to the same uh, setting. Okay, let's look at a, an electrical circuit and just trace the voltage through. Again, it's not very complicated. It is DC. Over here, we have a battery, and when we... Um, Observe the battery, it has a, a positive voltage on the normally open contacts of the A key switch. When we press the letter A, the switch switches over and closes the uh, normally open. Let's see if I can get this right. It's a hard remote control to operate. Okay, the A puts the uh, positive voltage down on the key on the plug board. The plug board is capable of actually transforming that letter A electrically over to some other letter, and in this case it's set to transform it over to the letter M. When the voltage gets to the letter M on the plug board, it goes up through another wire into the stack of rotors. The rotors carry this voltage in to a leftmost rotor-like thing, which is really a reflector, just an internal uh, wiring back system. And the voltage comes back out, having gone through the right rotors actually twice. The voltage comes back out and goes to the plug board again. And in this case, we can see that the letter Q has been activated with a positive voltage, and that letter Q has been jumpered over to the letter H. And finally, we see the voltage is now on the letter H. It goes up to the normally closed, normally closed contacts of the H um, keyboard key, and eventually lights up the H on the panel. Okay, so it's a really a very, very simple circuit, and you say to yourself, well, how can that be very complicated and very hard to break? And the answer is that there are a number of internal settings to the Enigma machine which can be adjusted. And let me just run through these and see how they add up to a tremendous number of possible initial days keys. First of all, we have a total of five rotors to pick three from, and we put those rotors in the Enigma machine in any order that we want. So the order of the rotors is one of the variables that goes into the day's key. And there are 60 possibilities right there. Each rotor has an internal setting that you can make, and there are 26 of these in each rotor, giving us a total number of internal ring settings, as they're called, of 676. And the rotors can be set to uh, 17,576 possible initial rotary starting positions. That is, you can rotate these with your thumb and observe that many possible combinations of the uh, initial settings through the little windows there. And you come back and see the enigma at the end of the talk and you'll see these things. The most complicated, confusing factor for the day's key is the plug board itself. And in the, in the front of the enigma, the plug board has a total of 26 sockets one for each letter of the alphabet, and you can have anywhere from zero to 13 jumper wires to connect these 26 sockets. And that gives you a possible number of settings of those jumper wires that keeps jumping on me here, uh, that equals a total of five times 10 to the 15th power. Now, if you add up all of those factors plus a few others, like the wiring of the reflector and so on, you end up with a total number of possible days keys um, of um, 10 to the 114th power. And that's a very big number for those of you who are not familiar with math. That's 10 followed by 114 zeros. And there are only 10 followed by 80 zeros atoms in the entire observable universe. So uh, Hitler and uh, Dönitz and all the U-boat people were very confident that nobody would be able to guess the proper day's key. And without the day's key, you can't decode the Enigma messages.
So the key to decoding the enigma is to get the day's key. Okay, uh, Dönitz, who was head of the U-boats, felt so confident that the Enigma machine was unbreakable that nobody could ever come up with these, uh, the, with the proper one of these settings, uh, that he built an immense radio transmitter, the biggest transmitter that had ever been built uh, by humans at that point. It was a very low frequency transmitter, transmitted from 15 to 60 kilohertz kilocycles in those days, uh, and it ran at one megawatt. So that was a big transmitter. You could practically hear that thing without a receiver in America. It was really pumping out a tremendous amount of signal. He used that to communicate with every single one of his U-boats, and he insisted that every single U-boat on the waters at that time communicate back to him. Not only back to him, but he insisted that every U-boat communicate their latitude and longitude position back to him every single day. He was that confident that it was impossible to break the Enigma code. And clearly, uh, it was he even knew that it was being intercepted by the Allies. Heck, anybody on Earth could practically tune into that transmitter. But he was so confident that the Enigma code was unbreakable, that nobody could guess the proper one of the 10 to the 114th power uh, possibilities, that he kept on doing this throughout the entire war. And uh, that was really quite amazing. Uh, the U-boats were a tremendous danger during the war. As we've seen, they sank a lot of ships. But the U-boat menace was gradually ameliorated by Enigma deciphering and some other techniques that I'm going to talk about. Let's look at the deciphering of the Enigma machine. If any of you have seen the Imitation Game movie, how many of you have seen the Imitation Game? Okay, well then you may have believed that Alan Turing broke the code, and this was the moment at which Alan Turing broke the code. This is a particularly exciting scene for me because the enigma that Alan Turing broke the code on is one that I actually found and restored and uh, is being shown in the movie. And you'll see a little later on in the talk the moment at which I first saw this enigma and discovered it and managed to buy it. Anyway, here's Alan Turing, great hero, breaking the code, saving the world, and here he is again with this incredible machine that he called the bomb that he built and designed and everybody believes that he designed it and he's the hero, he's saving the world and so on, but unfortunately it isn't true. Uh, the real story of deciphering the enigma uh, comes from the work of three brilliant Polish mathematicians and the Polish Cipher Bureau. And these uh, Polish mathematicians and Poland itself were terrified at the end of World War I because Poland is sandwiched between two parts of Germany. Germany was split by the Treaty of Versailles, and Poland knew that they were going to be invaded by Germany. So they did an all-out effort to try and break the code that the Germans were using to encode their military messages and find out when Poland was going to be invaded. The major work was done by three brilliant mathematicians led by Marian Yevsky, who managed to calculate the German military enigma wiring. He figured out the internal wiring of every one of the rotors used in the enigma, and he managed to build the first enigma deciphering machines. And this is not common knowledge because the British didn't bother telling people at the end of the war uh, or even during the war that this was going on. We'll talk a little more about that. What do we mean when we say he figured out the wiring in the Enigma? Every rotor has an internal wiring maze in which the input letter contact is connected to some other output letter contact, not the same letter. And it was up to Ryevsky and his team to figure out the wiring for every one of the five rotors that were being used in the Enigma. And he managed to do that by what many people believe is one of the most extraordinary feats of mathematical logic that has ever been performed. 
I won't go into that, but it's fascinating reading if you want to read about that. Once they had the wiring of the rotors, they began building their own Enigma machines. This is a Polish replica of an Enigma built like an Enigma and built by the Poles to help them in decoding the Enigma messages. And he designed, Ryevsky and his team, designed the first Enigma decoding machine, which they called a bomb. Nobody really knows why he called it a bomb. Some people say it was because it ticked like a time bomb, and other people say it was named after a famous Polish dessert, which was called a bomb. So that's one of the great mysteries in history, but not one of the critical ones. Uh, so uh, uh, Ryevsky designed this machine. It spun rotors just like Enigma rotors up on top with a motor and lit up lights here and you look for coincidences of lights. A very complicated operation. Uh, it would take me a couple of lectures to describe how it worked. But uh, Ryevsky and his team actually managed from 1933 to 1939 to successfully decipher Enigma messages. So for six years before Turing had anything to do with this, the Poles were successfully reading the Enigma messages. And it was was only in 1939 that they were forced to stop because in 1939 Poland was invaded by Germany. At that po moment, the Poles gave their Enigma replicas and bombs first to the French, who weren't that interested, and then to the British. And the British in 1939 took over all code breaking, giving no credit to the Poles. And only in 1999 did the British finally erect a little monument in Bletchley Park saying, oh, by the way, thank you, Poles. We appreciate your help on this. But again, it's always the Poles helped us. But it isn't the Poles helped us. The Poles led the way. And it, the Poles have not gotten credit for that. Um, a number of Poles have always been been after me to, to emphasize that point in my lecture, so I'm emphasizing. Okay, so here we are now in Bletchley Park with post-1939, uh, in the process between 1939 and 1945, 10,000 code breakers worked at Bletchley Park breaking the Enigma code. And they uh, managed to do this quite successfully. When the Enigma code was broken, the translated messages, the decoded messages, were given the name, the code name, ULTRA. And so ULTRA refers to the messages that were decoded, the German messages. The 10,000 code breakers were threatened with death if they ever, ever revealed the work they were doing at Bletchley Park. Some of them actually had a pistol held to their head and had to sign an oath that they would never reveal this. So it ended up that husbands and wives and parents never knew what these people were doing at Bletchley Park for a period of 30 years after the war. That is, from 1945 until 1975, nobody knew that the British had uh, helped by the Poles or led by the Poles had succeeded in cracking the Enigma code. Uh, what this did was to uh, actually force us to throw out all World War II history books that had been written before 1975 because the Enigma had such a dramatic effect on the winning of the war. All of those books were just obsolete. So if you're a World War II historian, you know you just don't even bother reading anything if it was written before 75. In 75, a man named Winterbottom was given the permission to reveal the secret and he did and amazed the world, but good old Admiral Turnitz still refused to, to believe that the Enigma code had been broken. And I've been taking oral histories of Germans uh, on my trips to hunt for Enigmas over there. Several of them have told me, you know, that business about the British breaking the code, that's just propaganda. The British never could have broken the code. So to this day, people in Germany, some of them believe that the code, the Enigma code, was unbreakable. 
Um, so Alan Turing himself, of course, a brilliant mathematician, did take over and did extraordinary things at Bletchley Park. He helped with the design of a much improved and much faster version of the Polish bomb, and it was uh, uh, an extraordinary complex machine. If you get over to Bletchley Park, you can uh, walk in back of this machine and just be overawed by the complexity. Yes, yes, I know it's DC and not gigahertz, but it's still complex believe it or not, and uh, the magnificent machine. Turing was basically, uh, his basic contrib contributions were that he managed to keep up with the changes the Germans made in how they encoded their messages. They did build uh, an Enigma machine. They added a rotor to an Enigma machine, and Turing was able to keep up with these changes, and eventually participated in the design of a much, much, much faster bomb, which used paper tape, punch paper tape, running at very high speed past photoelectric detectors in order to uh, allow it to check out possibilities much faster. Uh, Turing was helped by a number of techniques. Um, the capture of code books from U-boats and other boats was very helpful. A code book gave exact settings, the day's key settings, for an entire month. So if you could capture a code book, you would know how to set each of the rotor settings and the plug board settings for every day of the month. And in U-boats, they were often supplied with two months worth of code books. So that was a big deal if they could capture a U-boat. But it's hard to capture a U-boat um, when the captain has been told he had to throw the code books overboard and when it's quite likely that the U-boat will sink before you get on it. Uh, there were also repeat predictable words in messages that could be searched for. The most frequent word in a German message was the uh, word for the number one. There were no numbers on the Enigma keyboard, so uh, eins was a word that you could search for, and that reduced the uh, time it took to decode Enigma messages. Uh, another uh, factor was that the Enigma machine, if you remember back to my diagram, is incapable of encoding a letter to itself. So you can't encode the letter T and get a T as a ciphertext version of that. And that gave people another little foot in the door to cracking the Enigma. Uh, many of these other, uh, there were many other uh, discoveries and probably best, cop, uh, best uh, covered by uh, David Kahn in a wonderful book named Seizing Enigma. Um, here's a picture of a uh, weather ship being boarded and uh, uh, the Enigma um, books and the Enigmas were removed and the crew was led below deck so they wouldn't see people removing the books because these people, the crew would end up as prisoners of war and prisoners prisoners war have generally networks where they can get information back to Germany and it was critically important that the Germans not be aware that the Enigma machine was being read. And that led to a lot of problems. Uh, you had to make big decisions. If you knew, for instance, as Churchill may have, that the town of Coventry was to be bombed three days from now, he had an option of evacuating the town. But if he did that, the Germans would see that the town had been evacuated, suspect that the Enigma coding had been broken, and uh, he would, <clears throat> uh, and the Germans would then become aware that we were reading the Enigma code. So a number of decisions had to be made, never by Turing, as shown in the movie, but always by Churchill and his staff, uh, and some of those re resulted in uh, the loss of lives. Um, Enigma deciphering is thought by many historians to have shortened the war by at least two years, saved thousands of lives, and prevented Hitler from completing the atomic bomb. So it was a pretty important uh, action. It was not, however, the only way that U-boats were located and sunk. Uh, direction finding was used. We all know that you can use a directional antenna and pinpoint the vector from your receiving station to a transmitter very easily. If you have two receiving stations, the point at which those vector lines crosses is the location of the U-boat. Believe it or not, 
Dönitz never told any of his U-boat captains about direction finding. He, the people, the captains of the U-boats, I just read a book by a U-boat captain, uh, and it, it turned out he knew nothing about this technique that the British had of direction finding. And that's a big, big surprise because all the way back in World War I, they used direction finding to locate radio transmitters. How come in World War II, the submarines didn't know that every single time they transmitted, not only were they sending out their latitude and longitude and being decoded, but they were also being located by their transmitter. Even more amazing, I think, is this factor. The Germans installed a radar detector to detect when uh, enemy ships with radar were nearby, called a METOX, like that little thing you put in your windshield to try and avoid the police giving you a speeding ticket, right? They had this on every single submarine, and by God, it was a super head and the superhead local oscillator radiated a signal. And the Allies, all they had to do is have their, their radios tuned to that frequency, and whenever they heard the signal from a local oscillator of a METOX, they knew that there was a submarine nearby, and then they could use their direction-finding antenna to locate the submarine. Not surprising that the submarines were sunk, but there's another factor, and that is the Enigma machines were sabotaged. It was amazing. Uh, one of the nice things about having found a total of about 60 Enigma machines and restored them is that I've had a chance to really look inside them, and they were actually sabotaged by some of the Jewish workers, prisoners who were forced to build Enigmas. Can you imagine anything dumber? You take your prisoners and have them build Enigmas for you? Of course the prisoners are going to try and sabotage the machine, but the important thing is that the sabotage can't can't be detectable until after the initial inspection. The Enigma has to pass inspection first, and then the sabotage has to take effect. Here's one way. You put a loose connector inside the Enigma, it rattles around and doesn't do anything until it happens to find its way up front here. When you push the key on the keyboard, that major operating bar hits this, doesn't make contact, and the Enigma stops working. Look at this one. We just discovered this about uh, three weeks ago. A fish hook. Can you see this guy, fish hook? This little black thing here, right up here is the barb of the fish hook. Somehow a fish hook found its way into the back of the plug board of an Enigma. What a great way to sabotage it. You know, it's going to work fine until the point of the Enigma of the fish hook uh, works its way into the contacts and shorts it out. Here's another one. The, uh, the plugs themselves always have a large pin on the top and a small pin on the bottom, but we found some with the pins reversed. And here's a really neat, sneaky way. Think about the ways you're going to do work to sabotage a machine. The, they actually, we found some screws that were too long that push down and clamp the wires to the pins. Normal screw length is this. This is a too long screw, and that screw is not going to compress the wire enough to make a reliable contact, so you get an intermittent contact in there. Darn clever, these prisoners. Uh, and finally, I discovered some screws with a coating on the outside of the screw, some kind of chemical, really weird stuff, because it apparently conducted electricity for a while, but gradually sort of rotted away the screw here. I've, I've sort of um, gotten some of it to come off on cloth up here so you could see it, but it, it became totally insulating. So uh, after a while, this, these screws became 100% insulated from the pins. Very neat stuff, and that had uh, a very big effect on the, uh, on the Enigma operation. At the end of the war, uh, Germany ordered the destruction of every single Enigma, and they used uh, explosives and guns and uh, threw them in lakes, and Churchill ordered the destruction of every Enigma and the bomb plans and the papers. And the question is, why did Churchill order that? Uh, and we found that out about uh, uh, last year. Um, what we found, first of all, was an Enigma machine with a Hebrew keyboard, if you can believe that. Very, very strange. Uh, so we tried to dig into the history of this Hebrew keyboard, and we found, after a lot of digging, that Churchill had given given 30 Enigma machines to Israel 
as a gift at the end of the war, saying, why don't you use these machines in your own military communications? He didn't bother to tell them that the British were able to read the Enigma. And the rest of the world, uh, everybody thought the British had gotten rid of all of their deciphering capability, so it looked to the Israelis as though it would be perfectly safe to use these machines. The only problem was that a man who had actually been working at Bletchley Park returned to Israel, and he noticed that the Israelis were starting to use Enigma machines in their military communications, and he couldn't tell them, hey, don't use those machines, because he'd been sworn to lifelong secrecy. So he went to uh, uh, David Ben-Gurion, and he said, the Enigmas are very interesting. <clears throat> Have you ever heard the story of the Trojan horse? And Ben-Gurion got the message and stopped using the enigmas. But uh, Churchill also, it turns out, gave enigmas to Spain, to South America, to Norway. All sorts of people all over the country had uh, enigmas and were using them, and the British were able to read those codes during the war. So uh, what happened to these enigmas? Uh, many of the enigmas were destroyed as ordered by grenades, and they look like that. Uh, I had a destroyed enigma from a battlefield back there. Battlefield dug enigmas uh, can actually be the source of some information. We can find bullet holes in them, and the bullet holes tell us, as here, that the enigmas were typically destroyed by a pistol rather than a rifle. And uh, in general, officers were the ones who uh, carried pistols. So apparently much of the destruction was done by officers. We also start looking for enigmas in lakes because the Germans threw some of their enigmas into lakes. Here's a lake in northern Germany, very poor visibility. So you have to use an underwater metal locator in order to find things. And we did that. And uh, over here, you see some of the metal that came up out of the lake. Over here is an enigma. The man who was operating the metal locator uh, at that point reached up with his hand and realized that he had an enigma in his hand. He dropped the metal locator and the visibility is so bad that we've never found the metal locator. But at least we got the enigma and the enigma was no great prize. Here it is. You can see that it was uh, destroyed before it was thrown into the lake, typically by being kicked in the front here, and we also matched up the bend in the light bulb panel to the butt of a German Mauser rifle, so we know uh, something about how these were destroyed. Um, another way of getting hold of uh, enigmas and studying them is to dive on the submarines. Here's a submarine that was sunk off uh, North Carolina, uh, originally looked like that, and diving on the submarine and in the submarine, which is about as scary a thing as you can possibly do, uh, fitting yourself and your tanks through a hole that's no bigger than yourself and your tanks is not a, a good way to stay alive, but when you do that, uh, you may be lucky enough to recover an enigma. And here's an enigma uh, as it looks after 70 years underwater. Uh, not a great prize, but certainly a very historic device. Another thing that's interesting themselves. And here's a rather nutty guy who happened to have grabbed up an enigma at the end of the war. And his goal was to get this Schmidt ME-109 fighter plane that he's sitting in flying again. And he needed a motor, and he needed some money to buy the motor. And he offered me that enigma, and I bought the enigma, and he has his motor. I hope he never flew that thing, because it was a wreck. Here's another man uh, who had an enigma machine. When you hunt for them, you come up with uh, some very strange characters. He spent most of the time talking about his machine gun and how much he loved it, uh, but he did manage to sell me an Enigma machine. It's a little scary when you, when you go to meet with these people, but really, really quite exciting. And here is the moment, the moment, the critical moment at which I first saw the Enigma that appeared in the imitation game. Not only that, but a total of three Enigmas. This guy 
actually had three enigmas in a little cupboard in his living room. And you can imagine that was a very, very happy day in uh, this hunter's life. Uh, here's a picture of the enigma. Uh, we took it apart and restored it uh, and appeared in the imitation game. There are a lot of people who are involved in the kind of work that I'm doing, history, hunting for enigmas. This is a get-together at Bletchley Park in 2009. We all got together and sort of um, exchanged lies and had a wonderful time telling stories and just, just great fun to communicate with all of these other people. And I'll just take you very quickly through the uh, machines that the Americans used and the Russians and will be done. This is uh, the American version of the Enigma. It's a World War II M209, a purely mechanical device in which uh, it has rotors. But if you look closely, you'll see the left-hand rotor has a finer pitch or distance between each letter on the rotor than the right-hand rotor. So they're variable pitch rotors. Uh, they can be set. And then there's a complex device back here where you can slide things back and forth and get very confused. You enter your letters with a wheel over here, and you read the coded letters on a punch tape. Uh, a more complex machine used by the Americans, um, never in the field, but uh, very complex and very effective, is called a Sigaba, based on the Enigma concept with a keyboard and rotors up in here. And it, again, printed out the coded version of the text or the decoded text on paper tape, which could be stuck onto mes message forms. And finally, we look at the Russian Cold War Enigma. This is a machine that was used by the Russians all through the Cold War. It has an extraordinarily more complex um, uh, working and concept, but the overall theory is exactly the same as the Enigma. It has 10 counter-rotating rotors, and back down here is a uh, punch paper uh, card, which uh, is the equivalent of the Stecker board. So uh, that's uh, my story, and I'll keep on tinkering with my enigmas. I hope you've enjoyed uh, going on a little trip then through hi the history of DC communications with me. Thank you. <laughs> the, I'll take a couple of questions and then uh, I'll be happy to answer lots of questions at the back of the room. Yes. They are gradually doing that. Um, one of the people who worked at Bletchley Park wrote a, a letter about it, and I think that there is a dramatic increase. The polls are becoming much more active and uh, vociferous about demanding their credit, too. So uh, it's moving in that direction. Yes? You said you had 60 of these enigmas yourself? I found a total of 60 in uh, 30 years of hunting. I, I don't think that the rankings have been published, but I, I probably have found more than anyone else. The, the general theory is that of the 23,000 enigmas, there are about 300 left in the world, and um, so I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> yes? Yep. They, they were, in it, as soon as the Poles gave them the plans, very shortly after that, they were able to decode some of the Enigma messages. But the Germans were not just sitting still, and so they changed some of their techniques and their technology a little bit. And there were periods during the war in which the British were unable to read anything when they added the fourth rotor, for instance, for a short period of time. And uh, different... Uh, branches of the German military used. It was a very unfortunate picture, right? <laughs> Let's see. There, there were no women in that group. Uh, there were a lot of wives, supportive wives, but no women in that group. And th these, are, these are people who, um, I, I don't think there are any of those people actually were code breakers. Um, they are historians. Yeah. Anybody else? 
Well, thank you all. Come back and play with the Enigma and have a good time with that.